Please turn with me in your Bibles to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, and verses 28 to 30. The title of the sermon tonight is Renewing Us into His Image, and you can see that thought right here in our text. Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Thus for the reading of God's word. Let's now turn in our hymnals to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 32, which is found on page 887, containing two questions, questions 86 and 87. I'll ask the question, you respond in unison with the answer. Question 86. Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ, without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also renewing us by his spirit into his image, so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for his benefits, and that he may be praised through us, and further, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits and by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. Question 87. Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways? By no means. Scripture tells us that no unchaste person, no idolater, adulterer, thief, no covetous person, no drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like will inherit the kingdom of God. Sorry, that's the next question down below. The column goes up, so that's the end right there. So tonight's topic is the doctrine of sanctification and good works under the heading of renewing us into his image. Remember that this is a key transition point in the uh, structure of the catechism. The catechism has three main parts after the introductory question concerning what is your only comfort and what must I know to live and die in this comfort after those two introductory questions. There are three parts to the catechism. Part one is consider concerning our guilt before God. Part two is the grace of God in delivering us from our guilt through Christ. And then part three is on gratitude. And that is where we are now uh, transitioning to. We're transitioning to that third part of the catechism on gratitude. Guilt, grace, and gratitude. Or misery, deliverance, and gratitude. I like the one that has the alliteration of the three G's. Uh, we have to understand our sinfulness and how far we fall short of God's glory. We have to understand that, that Adam uh, plunged the whole human race into a state of corruption. And so as a result of that, we are born sinners with a corrupt nature. And then we also add to Adam's own sin with our own sins as the fruit of that corrupt nature. But God did not leave us there in that state of sin and misery. And so the bulk of the catechism is dealing with that second major section on the grace of God in the gospel. The catechism uses the uh, Apostles' Creed as the summary of what the gospel is and going through it line by line and showing us how we are saved by the work of Christ, how he suffered for us, he rose again for us, and so we have the forgiveness of sins and justification through Christ. Having expounded the Apostles' Creed, having drawn out the implications of that for us in terms of the gospel, then we come to the third major section of the Catechism, which asks this key pivotal question, 
since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ, since we have received grace to cover our guilt, since we've been delivered, part two, from our misery, part one, by grace through Christ, without any merit of our own, right? It's all of grace. It's free grace. We are justified by faith alone on the basis of what Christ has done alone. Since all this is true, why then should we do good works? Why? Why should we do good works? It seems like it's unnecessary. Christ has done all the works for us. We don't need to do any good works. We're saved by grace, so therefore let us sin that grace may abound. It may seem. But the Catechism answers that by saying, because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also renewing us by his spirit into his image, so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for his benefits. The reason why we do good works is not in order to be redeemed or in order to be justified. That's already been accomplished once for all by Christ. But the reason we do good works is because having been redeemed by his blood, Christ is also sanctifying us. He is also renewing us by his spirit into his image. And as a result of that renewing work of Christ in us, we do good works. So I have three points tonight. The origin of good works, point one. Uh, point two is the necessity of good works, and the Catechism deals with that in question 87. Question 87, the second question there. Can those be saved who do not turn from God from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways? The answer is no. So that's the second point, the necessity of good works. And then thirdly, the motive. The motive of good works is Gratitude, it is thankfulness for the salvation that we have in Christ. But first of all, we need to look at this key point, which is the origin of our good works. The good works that we do do not arise from us, but from Christ's own work in us. That's the fundamental point that the Catechism is stating there. Our good works do not arise from our own will, from our own decision to try to be good, but they arise from Christ himself working in us. Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also renewing us by his spirit into his image. And that is also what our text that we read earlier states. Romans chapter 8. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, He's talking about the doctrine of election and predestination, but notice how it's put in this language of God calling us according to his purpose, which is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. Verse 9, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined for this purpose, to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, that is through the preaching of the gospel, and granted them faith, that's effectual calling. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Now you might think, well, maybe uh, it's not really talking about sanctification when it says there that uh, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Maybe it's talking about glorification at the end. And you would be within good grounds to say that because of the fact that it mentions glorification right there in the next verse. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. But I think that that is certainly a big part of it. I think that ultimately our, our ultimate transformation into the image of Christ will be at the last day when our bodies are raised. But I don't think that sanctification is... Um, being overlooked here. I think that sanctification is an important part of this process of being conformed to the image of his son. And we can see that from verse 28, because verse 28 says that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And even earlier in the passage in, in Romans 8, we have a long discussion about 
how the Spirit is at work in us, sanctifying us. So sanctification is definitely in view, but recognizing that the full conformity to the image of Christ will not happen until the very end at the resurrection. But even now, even before we reach that goal, he is already at work within us, renewing us, transforming us. He is even giving us trials and tribulations and sufferings for the purpose of conforming us into his image, all with a view to that glorious day when that image is perfected and we are raised in newness of life. Now, there's a key thought here, though, that we need to think about, and that is that it says that we are being conformed to the image of his son. And it's impossible not to think of that, not only in terms of being like Christ, but also in terms of the original image of God in which man was created. The image of God in which man was created is fully revealed for us. Adam sinned and that image was shattered, but now it's fully revealed to us in Christ. Christ is the, the image of God. And so in being conformed to the image of Christ, we can also think of that as the restoration of the shattered and tarnished image of God as a result of the fall. And Paul makes that connection in Colossians, an interesting cross-reference to our text in Romans is Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices, and I put on the new self, and I prefer even to use the language, the new man, not to exclude the women, but it helps us to think in terms of the image of God at creation, right? That man was made in the image of God. So we put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So there's this idea then of being renewed in the image of God. So we can tie Colossians 3.10 to Romans 8 verse 30, uh, or verse 29 actually, and see this idea of being conformed to the image of Christ as also being understood as the renewing of the image of God in us. We do not sanctify ourselves. We do not renew ourselves into the image of God by doing good works. Rather, when we do good works, that is a consequence, that is a fruit, that is a result of Christ himself working in us by his Spirit to renew us and to sanctify us. That's really the key thing. So this first point, right? The origin of good works. Where do good works come from? They come from the work of Christ by his spirit in us, renewing us and transforming us into his image. We do not sanctify ourselves by doing good works, but rather Christ sanctifies us progressively, more and more transforming us into his image and then as a result, we do good works. I think it's helpful to um, think about this whole topic of the relationship between good works and sanctification by comparing the, the evangelical gospel understanding of sanctification with the uh, idea from Aristotle. Now, Aristotle also talked a lot about the importance of uh, being a virtuous person. He wrote a whole treatise uh, on this topic of morality and ethics and being a virtuous person uh, called the Nicomachean Ethics. Maybe some of you have heard about it. I know some of you have. Uh, and in that, he talks about this idea of the importance of um, being a virtuous person. Uh, but all of Aristotle's idea about how to be virtuous, how to be good, is totally different from the biblical gospel view of sanctification. There are some similarities, but there's also some major differences. Aristotle said that we acquire virtues, let's say being a temperate person, that is somebody that's not given over to the pleasures of the body, but is, uses self-restraint, or being a just person, somebody who's fair and treats other people justly, or being a brave person by not being a coward, but by being brave and uh, doing what is right, even if it is dangerous. We become just and temperate and brave. We acquire these virtues by doing just and temperate and brave things. That's Aristotle's definition of, his doctrine of 
quote-unquote sanctification, if you will. It's not the biblical view. It's not the Christ-centered, evangelical view of sanctification. It's just this natural, philosophical idea that we become just, temperate, and brave by doing just, temperate, and brave acts. And that's why, of course, he spends a lot of time uh, in that treatise on ethics talking about the importance of raising children because you raise children to become good citizens, to be virtuous people, by training them to do virtuous things and virtuous acts. So child rearing and child training is very important for developing virtue. Somebody that was raised badly and was not trained to be a good person is going to end up being an unvirtuous person and is going to be um, full of uh, injustice and intemperance and cowardice and all the vices that are the opposite of the virtues. On the other hand, though, on the other hand, there is an, an, an aspect, an element of Aristotle that is not completely wrong. Aristotle recognizes that the goal is not simply to do good acts. He recognizes that the goal is to do them so repeatedly and ideally from youth that you find virtue enjoyable. That's the real goal. The goal is to acquire virtue not simply as something that you do, but to acquire virtue as a habit. Now, the word habit, when he uses this term, is different from our use of the word habit. We think of habits in a very uh, behavioristic way, like, you know, it only takes 60 days to create a new habit, you know, the habit of brushing your teeth every day, things like that. He's using the word habit as in a different way from that. For him, a habit is a disposition of your soul. And so the goal is to acquire virtue as a habit or disposition of the soul. Aristotle said that the key test of virtue is the pleasure that accompanies virtuous behavior. He says, a man is temperate if he abstains from bodily pleasures and finds this abstinence itself enjoyable. Because the disposition of his soul, the habit, using it in that technical sense, is that he has this disposition of soul that he enjoys the virtue of abstinence. It's not just simply that he does abstinent things and is temperate, but that his soul has been formed and fashioned to the point where he actually enjoys it. And the opposite of that is vice, where the person does not enjoy virtuous behavior, finds virtuous behavior irksome, and actually delights in wicked behavior. And so the proper education of children then aims at training them not only to do good, but to want to do good, to enjoy doing good. So there is an element of truth to that, because that is what Christ is doing in us in sanctification, is that he's changing our heart. He's changing our disposition. He's implanting within us a supernatural habit of grace in which we desire what is good. We find it enjoyable because we want to be like Christ, because we love Christ so much that we want to be conformed to his image. And therefore, we do good works, not simply because it's required, not simply because the opposite of that is disobedience and sin, and we know that that's wrong, but because we want to do good, because of this work of grace that is happening within us. So on the one hand, Aristotle is right that the ultimate goal is to have a virtuous habit of soul, not simply virtuous actions. But on the other hand, Aristotle is completely wrong in saying that the way we acquire that is by doing virtuous deeds. The way we become sanctified in Aristotle's theology of sanctification, if you can call it that, is by doing virtuous behavior. Virtuous behavior, repeating it over and over again, is what makes us sanctified. But the gospel mystery of sanctification is completely reversed. The gospel mystery of sanctification is that we do good works because Christ himself, by his spirit, as the catechism says, is renewing us into his image and is implanting in our soul a new, quote-unquote, habit of grace. That is a new disposition towards that which is good. It is a supernatural habit implanted in us by the spirit. Actually, it begins at regeneration, even before we talk about progressive sanctification, it begins at regeneration. The moment that a sinner is regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit 
and passes from death to life. At that moment, a supernatural disposition is implanted in that sinner's heart. Yes, there is still remaining corruption. Yes, there is still the struggle with uh, our remaining sin. But fundamentally, a person's heart is changed by the work of the Spirit in regeneration. And then that continues in progressive sanctification as Christ, by his Spirit, continues to renew us into his image. But the key is we do not acquire that supernatural habit or disposition by doing good works. Rather, we do good works as the result, as the fruit, as the consequence of that change that has happened and is happening within us. John Owen is a, a very helpful theologian on this topic, and he explains this idea of supernatural habits of grace. He says a supernatural habit of grace is a principle of spiritual life and grace that is wrought in our souls by the Spirit and implanted in us, which inclines us to obedience. And it's implanted in all of our faculties, our mind, our heart, our will. The mind is our understanding of truth and our understanding of who Christ is by faith. The heart is the seat of our affections, where we not only know who Christ is, but we love him and we aspire to be like him. And then he also changes our will, which is the outflowing of the mind, heart, and the will. As the mind is focused upon Christ, the affections are transformed, and then that flows out into uh, inclining our wills to put off that which is sinful and to put on that which is righteous in Christ. In the Aristotelian view of sanctification, anyone can do this. Anyone can acquire natural habits by repeated actions. But those natural habits cannot produce true holiness and good works. The true good works that are the fruit of God's grace and the, the, the result of Christ's work in us. An unbeliever can be externally good to some degree. Or in, in, in many ways, there are some unbelievers out there that are even seemingly better than many Christians that we know. Where they are more virtuous, seemingly. But an unbeliever's external virtue is simply a false virtue. It is not an internal change in his heart, and his heart is still far from God. He does not do those good things out of a gratitude for the salvation that he has in Christ. He does not do those things in his sense of delighting in the beauty of being Christ-like. He doesn't love Christ and desire to be like Christ. True sanctification does not consist in developing natural habits, but rather in the work of Christ, renewing us by his spirit into his image. This is exactly what Jesus taught, isn't it? Think about all the places, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, which we have been going through over the past uh, couple of years. In Matthew, Jesus talks about this all the time. For example, Matthew chapter 7 he says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Later in Matthew 12, he repeats this analogy again. The tree and the fruit, right? The tree itself is that fundamental disposition of the heart, and the fruit is the result that flows from it. In Matthew 12, he says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. And in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> he makes clear that the goodness of the tree does not depend upon us. The goodness of the tree is that we are branches united to Christ, united to the vine, and we receive that goodness from Christ, which then flows through us by the Spirit. So that's the first point. What is the origin of good works? It is Christ himself working in us by his spirit and renewing us and restoring the image of God in us. Secondly, though, there is the necessity of good works. If all this is true, that Christ is working in us and he is transforming us and he's doing so at this heart level, at this profound level that is even before we get to actual deeds of of righteousness and good works, if all this is true, then no one who is regenerate will be destitute of good works. This supernatural habit or disposition cannot fail to produce good behavior. That was the point of, Paul, of, um, of Jesus' 
teaching in the parable of the sower and the seed in Matthew 13. Remember the different soils, the rocky soil and so on? The only soil that produced fruit was the good soil. That is the soil that had been regenerated, the soil that had that new heart. As for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, another 60 and in another 30. And so by implication then the other ones who had some contact with the gospel, maybe even temporary faith in the gospel, maybe even some kind of a profession of faith in Christ, although it didn't last, but the fact that they didn't produce fruit shows that they were never truly regenerated to begin with. The Apostle Paul teaches something similar in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, and this is one of the proof texts in the Catechism under question 87. Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways? By no means. Scripture tells us, and they quote there from 1 Corinthians 6, Scripture tells us, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This is a vice list. Reminds you of Aristotle, right? It's a vice list, a list of vices, which implies the opposite virtues. The opposite of sexual immorality is sexual holiness and purity in Christ. And he's saying, Paul is saying that those who live this way, who give themselves over in a habitual lifestyle of committing these sins, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that a Christian who struggles with some of these things and who, um, who does sin uh, in some of these ways doesn't mean that they're excluded from the kingdom just because they sinned, but rather it's that they repent of it. They know that it's wrong and they desire to grow and to be sanctified. Paul is not condemning to hell all those who struggle. The key here is repentance. That's why he says, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Don't let anybody think you that you can be a professing Christian and persist in these sins without repentance. It's necessary. These good works are necessary because they are the necessary outworking of that work of Christ in us, renewing us into his image. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 7. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. You were simply making a hypocritical profession of faith in me. Wonderfully, though, the Apostle Paul, after making this list of vices and saying that those who persist in these as a disposition, as a habit of life, without turning from it, he does apply the gospel to the Corinthian Christians. And he even says, wonderfully, amazingly, that such were some of you. Some of you, before you were converted, were thieves, were greedy, were drunkards, were adulterers, and sexually immoral and idolaters. That's true, you were. You were those things by your habit of life. You had a disposition that was formed towards these things, and you engaged in these behaviors because you delighted in them. You were that way, but, he says, you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. How wonderful it is to know that that past way of life is over. Doesn't mean we don't struggle, but it's over. In Christ, it is done. We're washed, we're justified, and we are sanctified. Paul doesn't use the term repentance here, but it's implied. He says, such were some of you. And they had repented and turned to the Lord. And they're continuing to repent and continuing to put off those sinful patterns 
and to put on that which is pleasing to the Lord. Justification and sanctification are both mentioned in that verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Both justification and sanctification are mentioned. And the point of that is that both are necessary, that they're inseparable. You were sanctified, you were justified. The order there doesn't mean anything. He's not saying that sanctification is before justification. Uh, you can tell that because he mentions washed before sanctified and washed and justified are equivalent terms. He's simply trying to bring out all the fullness of the blessings that we have in union with Christ. We have justification, we have sanctification, ultimately we have glorification. And all these things flow to us in union with Christ. And so if we're united to him for justification, then we are also united to him for sanctification. There's no such thing as a Christian who says, I've been justified, but I don't need to pursue holiness. Holiness is necessary. No matter what profession you make of claiming to be justified and claiming to be a Christian, if you do not have this life of continually turning from your sin, acknowledging that it's wrong when you do commit it, and seeking God's grace to live a holy life, then that is an indicator that you are not a true child of God. Justification is never separated from sanctification. But then, there's also this third point, which is the motive of good works. We don't do good works in order to prove that we're justified. We don't do good works in order to be justified. We do good works because we have been justified. We do good works out of gratitude. And that language of gratitude perfectly captures the idea, doesn't it? Because what is justification? It's the gift of the perfect righteousness of Christ. It's a free gift. And we receive that gift simply with the empty hand of faith. We don't receive it by doing good works. We receive it simply with the empty hand of faith, of trusting in Christ and receiving the gift that is so freely offered to us. And as one who has received a gift then, how do we feel? How do we respond to that gift? We respond with thankfulness. We respond with gratitude. And gratitude perfectly captures the right relationship between justification and sanctification. There are some who confuse the two and say that justification and sanctification are just equally ultimate benefits of union with Christ, but there's no con connection between them. But the biblical view is no, gratitude is, the, is the, the key turning point where justification is the engine that drives the train and then sanctification follows along because of the gratitude that we have for receiving our justification in Christ. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 3 and verses 15 to 17. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What peace is that? That's the peace of knowing that we're right with God. The peace of knowing that we're justified, that we're accepted in Christ and that our sins have been forgiven. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let justification rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful, and be thankful for that justification. Be thankful for that peace of Christ that is ruling in your hearts. And one way we can do that is by singing songs and praising the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the gospel dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He mentions thankfulness and gratitude three times in verse 15, verse 16, and verse 17. It's such a powerful way of thinking about the Christian life. And it clearly shows the order, the priority, that justification is, is primary and sanctification comes along as a consequence of it but it's a necessary consequence. No one can be justified without also being sanctified. Sanctification is the necessary result, the necessary consequence. If we go back to Aristotle again, we could say that an unbeliever uh, who is trying to achieve virtue by doing good works repeatedly and 
trying to inculcate that virtuous habit of soul, is doing so uh, with the wrong motive. An unbeliever is not doing that out of thankfulness, right? An unbeliever is just trying to be a good person, trying to achieve this virtue, whether it's for the praise of man or even if it's a more philosophically advanced idea like Aristotle, that it's just good in itself to be a virtuous person and a virtuous person is happier than an unvirtuous person. But still, fundamentally, the unbeliever is trying to do it in order to win the applause of men or even their own self-praise of thinking about themselves as a good person. But they're not doing it out of gratitude. They're not doing it with that humility with that fundamental sense, that fundamental posture of praise and thankfulness to Christ for what he has done. That's what makes all the difference in the world. A thankful heart is a humble heart. A thankful heart is a heart that's full of praise and admiration for God's grace and falling at the feet of Christ and thanking him for his mercy and his love. A thankful heart is a heart that has a fundamentally different disposition, right? That supernatural habit of grace has been implanted into the heart by regeneration. And the key is that this thankfulness, as Paul says in Colossians 3.17, is directed to God the Father. Isn't that interesting? It's a very theocentric idea. This thankfulness is directed to God the Father, through Jesus Christ, directed to God the Father through the mediation of Christ. It's theocentric, but it's theocentric in a Christocentric manner. It's theocentric through a mediator. Because apart from the mediator, apart from Christ, God is simply this unrelenting judge who demands perfection and per demands holiness. And there's no possibility of being thankful and, and looking to God the Father as our Father, right? All we can do is look to him as a judge. But through Christ, because of our union with him, because we have been transferred out of death into life, because we've had this new heart planted in us by the Spirit, through Christ we can go to God and be thankful to him and view him as our Heavenly Father who loves us and who has our best interests at heart and who cares for us. Even when we're going through hard things, remember the context in Romans 8, is that whole discussion of suffering beforehand. And even when we are experiencing suffering and tribulation and difficulty and hardship and struggles, and even the struggles of sanctification and indwelling sin, even when we're going through hard times, we can, because our hearts have been changed, we can go to God and view him as our father through the mediation of Christ. And we can then be confident in him and trust him that no matter how hard it is, this thing that you're going through right now, no matter how hard it is, it's not a sign that God has abandoned you. It's not a sign that he is out to get you or that he has rejected you. It's actually a sign of his fatherly care and love for you and everything that he brings into your life, every hardship, every difficulty, even dare I say it, even your own sins, right? When you do fall into sin, that's also part of God's providential fatherly care for you to make you more aware of your need of Christ, to bring you closer to Christ. Even your sin, all things he says work together for good for those who love God, for, the, for those who are called according to his purpose. And so through Christ then, because of the mediation of Christ, we can view God as our Father, and we can be thankful to him. We can be thankful for the blessings that he gives us. We can even be thankful for the difficulties that he brings our way, because we know that he's doing all of that for our good and for our sanctification and to renew us more and more into the image of Christ, and that that work will be completed one day. Right now, it seems like a, an imperfect work. It seems like one of those construction sites that never seems to be finished. <laughs> and you drive by it every day and say, when are they going to finish this thing? That's what our, our lives feel like. An unfinished construction site that's just an eyesore and doesn't seem like it's going to be that good in the end. But one day it will be. One day it'll be revealed in glory. One day we will be glorified and we will stand before Christ and we will be his handiwork 
because he's the one that's doing all the work. We are his handiwork, and he's going to bring glory to himself in conforming us to his image in that ultimate sense of glorification at the last day. What a wonderful Savior we have, who not only has redeemed us by his blood, but who is renewing us into his image. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, how we thank you for your amazing, incredible grace to us in Christ. You have done all things well, and you are continuing to do it by your Spirit working in us. We thank you that we can trust you that even when difficulty comes into our lives and we are distraught with the pain of the suffering that we're experiencing, and we even begin to doubt and maybe even begin to question you and have thoughts of discouragement and frustration. Lord, we thank you that in spite of all that, we know that you are a good Heavenly Father and that you're working in us by your Spirit to transform us into the image of Christ, your Son. Help us to persevere. Help us to make a good use of all the trials you bring into our lives and to be thankful and to continue to trust you, to continue to walk with you day by day, to pray, to bring to you our needs and our burdens and desires, to commune with you through your word and spirit, and to know that you are working in us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your sustaining grace to uphold us. Even when we cannot sustain ourselves, you are upholding us by your grace. And we long for that day when your work will be revealed in all of its glory, when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And then we, as your redeemed people, will enjoy eternal fellowship with you, the triune God, forever and ever. That is our goal and that is our hope. In Christ's name we pray, amen.